Hi friends, I'm Max Lucado. Did you know that the Bible makes more than 100 references to the Holy Spirit? Jesus says more about this counselor than he does about the church, marriage, finances, and the future. In my new book, Help Is Here, we'll take a deep dive into who the Holy Spirit is and how to access the joy, power, peace, and purpose he offers. Be encouraged. Help is here. Available now at MaxLucato.com. Hi, everybody. Max Lucato here from my home to yours. Thanks so much for joining me for today's encouraging word. God bless you. God bless you. We're finding some strength, at least I hope we are, in the greatest verse in the Bible, John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If I only had one verse to share with somebody, that would be it. I love that passage so much that many years ago, it was not that many years ago, a few years ago, I wrote a book about it creatively entitled 316. We need the promise of this passage. Boy, we're facing so many, so many challenges, so many fears. We really need to go upriver of these fears and get our relationship right with God. And according to John 316, we can understand how that happens. Why would God give his one and only son? There's a question. What is it about the death of Christ that means life to you. Now let's, let's answer that by looking at this claim of Christ that he never sinned. When you make a list of the claims that make him kingly or crazy, don't miss this one. He asserted to have the only sinless heart in all of history. Did you know he once invited people? Can any of you convict me of a single misleading word, a single sinful act. That's in John chapter 8. Now, if you ask that question or issue that challenge to my friends and family, you're going to see hands pop up like, like wheat in a Kansas wheat field. But in response to Jesus' challenge, nobody could respond. Nobody spoke up. No one. No one could convict him of a single sin. His enemies had to drum up false charges, remember, in order to arrest him. Pilate, the highest ranking official in the region, took a good look at Christ and said, I find no guilt in this man. Peter, who lived in Jesus' shadow for three years, he recorded the words, he never did one thing wrong. Never. Not once. Not once said anything amiss. Check that verse out. It's in 1 Peter 2 and verse 22. So the standard of Christ mutes all of our boasting by comparison. You know, we don't have anything to brag about. Many years ago, I experienced something remotely similar. I met a golf legend by the name of Byron Nelson. I was brand new to the game. I'd just broken 100 on the golf course. I shot a 98. I was so proud of myself. And about that time, a friend had an appointment with Mr. Nelson, and he asked me if I'd like to come along and meet him. So in route, I bragged about my score, about my double digit score. I offered a whole by whole commentary. And my friend, afraid that I might do the same in the presence of the retired icon, asked me, now, you know who we're about to go meet, right? And you know what he's accomplished, correct? And he began to remind me. He reminded me that Mr. Nelson won five major golf titles. He has a streak of 11 consecutive victories that's never, anywhere, no one's come close to. During that streak, uh, he, his average score was 68. All of a sudden, my 98 seemed very insignificant. The standard of Mr. Nelson silenced me. The standard of Christ silences us. Now, this is a question that's important. How will Christ respond to our sinful lives, our unholy hearts? He's perfect. We are imperfect. Is he just going to pretend we never sinned? Is he just going to gloss over our, 
our rebellion? Is he just going to say boys will be boys, girls will be girls? A holy God cannot do that. A holy God cannot. His, his commands are commands. They're not suggestions. Uh, they come from his holy self. And he could not remain holy. He could not be a just judge and not punish our sins. And Jesus made his position clear. He said, anyone whose life is not holy will never see the Lord. He spoke through the Hebrew writer there, chapter 12 and verse 14. Hard-hearted souls will not populate heaven. What heaven is going to be so great because there won't be any curse there, no sin there. It is a pure in heart who will see God, Jesus said, Matthew 5 and verse 8. Well, where does that leave the impure? <laughs> the impure in heart. What do we do? Well, this bear with me here. But I want to tell you a word that really helps us. It's the word hyper, H-Y-P-E-R. It's a Greek word that means in place of or on behalf of. New Testament writers repeatedly turned to this preposition to describe the work of Christ. Here's some phrases that you'll perhaps recognize. Christ died for our sins, hyper for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Christ gave himself for our sins. Galatians 1 and verse 4. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse hyper, H-Y-P-E-R, for us. And Jesus himself prophesied that the good shepherd lays down his life hyper for the sheep, for the sheep. And greater love has no one than this, than that he lay down his life. What's the word you want to guess? Hyper for his friends. Before his death, Jesus took the bread and he explained, this is my body given hyper, given for you. And when he presented the cup, he explained the same thing. This is the cup. He explained, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out hyper, which is poured out for you. Now, forgive me for sounding hyper about hyper. But the point is crucial. Christ exchanged hearts with you. He placed your sin in himself and invited God to punishment. A passage we've already looked at. The Lord put on him the punishment for all the evil that we have done. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 6. There was a Chinese Christian who understood this point. And before her baptism, a pastor asked a question to ensure that she understood the significance and the meaning of the cross of Christ. And he asked her this question. She said, did Jesus have any sin? And she said, oh, yes. <laughs> Troubled, the pastor repeated, making, maybe he wasn't clear. He said, are you sure he had sin? Of course, the lady said. I'm confident Jesus had sin. The leader set out to correct her, but she interrupted him. Not of his own, she said, but he had mine. You see, though sinless, Jesus took our sin. Though healthy, Jesus took our disease on himself. And though diseased, we who accept his offer are pronounced healthy. And more than pardoned, friend, we are declared innocent, innocent. We enter heaven, not with healed hearts, but with his heart. It's as if we never sinned. The scripture says if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a, a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Praise be to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Is that not the greatest news? You say, Max, yeah, okay. But if I have the heart of Christ, then why is my heart still so rebellious, troubled, anxious? Well, here's the answer. It takes time to get used to your new heart. A heart transplant patient can't run a marathon the day of or the day after surgery. It takes time. The adjustment takes time. Our sanctification takes a lifetime. Salvation takes a moment. Sanctification takes a lifetime. But God will renew your heart. What's important is that right now you believe 
that when you gave your heart to Christ, he gave his heart to you. When you gave your heart to Christ, he gave his heart to you. It's in there. It's in there. I'm like you. Sometimes I feel like I still got my old heart in me, but that's not true. So let's heed the word and not heed our feelings. There's a new heart inside of you and it's going to come out. It will. You just keep praying. You just keep trusting. You just keep opening the Bible. You keep turning your heart to God and it's going to get closer and closer, more and more like him every day. Now, if you've never done that, you can, you can. You can give your heart to him right now. You do not want to appear before the judgment seat of Christ with your heart. You don't. You don't. It's too stained with sin and rebellion. Let him give you a new heart. I don't know how much longer we have on earth. I don't. Could be, <laughs> it could be that this pandemic is, is really not the signal of the end times. But boy, I just wonder. I just wonder. Regardless if it is or not. You can give him your heart and you can begin a new life today. Just say, Lord Jesus, I give you my old heart. I confess to you my sins and I receive you as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer today, God bless you. Now, let me be the first to welcome you into the family of God. Find yourself a Bible and read it. Find yourself a church and attend it, even if only online a place where you can be baptized, a place where you can belong, a place where you can grow in your faith. God bless you. Talk to you soon. Hey, this is Dina Lynn Lakato. Max and I are so thankful you joined us for today's encouraging word. Please subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss a single message. For more information about Max's ministry, please visit maxlocato.com. Until next time, stay encouraged. Hello friends, Susan here with Team Locato. We're excited to announce a fresh take on Max's best-selling 365-day devotional, Grace for the Moment, Note-Taking Edition. Each page of this beautiful leather soft edition has plenty of room to pen your own prayers and insights. You can order your copy of Grace for the Moment note-taking edition now at maxlocato.com.